Hi, I'm Ryan Davis. And I'm Kieran Schmidt. <laughs> and this is Out of Office, a travel podcast. The seat taken. Hey, Kieran. Oh, Ryan, it's so it's so nice to see you. Oh, you know, it's uh it's it's been so long since we've recorded. Now you're looking um you're looking like you're anticipating something, like you've got a trip coming up. Are you going back to Mexico City? No, no, no. I'm doing some travel. I'm go- I'm heading to Budapest. Wow, uh, Buda, all the way to Hungary. All the way to Hungary, yeah. yeah. Will you come back and do an episode? I would love that. That would be back. great because we've heard so much about uh, Mexico City. Yeah, well, I have been, I have been, I've been to Budapest before, so this will be my second time. And that's I, I great will... though because that means you start to get to do the kind of more off the beaten path yeah. stuff. You can yeah. come back with the secrets. Oh, oh I, I, I know the secrets. Yeah, yeah. So we'll do it. We'll do an episode. That sounds fun. Can I put in a request? Uh, yes. You may remember very early in the run of the pod. Um, I used to talk about funiculars a fair amount. I love a funicular. I, someday we're going to do great funiculars of the world as an episode. Like funicular manslaughter? <laughs> no, funiculars. You know, those like little, uh, the little trains that go up a steep side of the oh, mountain and they're kind of cut. Yeah, at, like yeah. A, I, I didn't know that was a term for that. 40 degree angle. Yeah, funicular. Yeah. It's got fun, right? There's it? one of those in Bogota that goes right up the, the Mount Rosa. Ex- yeah. Exactly. And yeah. you're going to go to Bogota this year too, right? Uh, yeah, totally. Well, I mean, we're going to have funicular. We're going to have some fun with funiculars. There's there no a, question. Is there a funicular in, in, in Budapest? There is. There's a funicular in Budapest. Um, you know how like one part, like, like either, so the river divides the city. Buda and Pest? Right. Yeah. And I think Pest is the flat side, right? Sure, yeah. <laughs> and I think Buda... They've got a um, they've got a, a funicular on that side, and I would like you to uh, please ride that funicular. Maybe maybe take a video for the the old Instagram. Well, uh, that sounds like a funicular good time. Okay, and uh, <laughs> but so uh, before you head out to Budapest, we we've got we've got to talk today about the. Uh, I mean, this, this is a great episode, a great episode for you to go out on. And you know what? You can you can tag out. I'm taking hold of the show today because I've got a fantastic interview with. Uh, a woman named Valerie Stimmick. And uh, she's the author of a, of a guidebook by Lonely Planet called Dark Skies, A Practical Guide to Astro Tourism. Now, this isn't like space tourism. It's not like what we've talked about before. What she's done is uh, gathered and researched a guide for all the best places on Earth to go stargazing. So really? she talks about dark sky sites, a lot of national parks, she talks about best place to see the solar eclipse, best place to see the aurora borealis, um, and and it just just to go out stargazing. And uh, it's it's something I feel like I haven't done that enough, but I've always aspired to uh, to take advantage of kind of the dark sky. There's even an international dark sky association that we talk about, and uh, it's a great interview with Valerie Stimmick and a very unique guide. You know, dark skies is also uh, the name of an of a '90s sort of X Files ripoff. Oh, but is that right? Secret, yeah, a secret military, a secret like sort of intelligence investigators <laughs> who and they look for aliens and 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 they look they need to dark skies to do that. Well, I'll tell you what, I will uh, try to dig up the theme song for that, and oh, uh, maybe we can merge into the interview with Valerie uh, by playing a little dark skies theme. <laughs> I, I'm guessing it's that very that's, spooky. I'm sure. I'm guessing very... that, that that copyright doesn't get a uh, get uh, flagged. No, yeah, it doesn't get flagged I don't too think often. No one's looking for that. No, I've no. never even heard of it. What did, what network was it on? Uh, like UPN or Fox or something like that, you know? Uh, I hope that she doesn't know about this and I can be <laughs> the one to tell her about it. Um, but, you know, speak of, before we get to the interview, Ryan. Yes. Uh, we've already covered that you're going to Budapest. You're going to lots of places. You're going to Budapest. You're going to LA. You're going to uh, uh, Montreal. I mean, this, this I guy mean, Kieran, is... I, ho- I host a travel podcast, but I don't know what you expect I, out of me. I, listen, I'm thrilled because uh, <laughs> the burden of carrying all the travel has been heavy on these shoulders. And frankly, I've got a son now. And so, uh, yeah. you know, for, for the immediate yeah. future, uh, you know, mostly I'm traveling from the living room here to the podcast studio. When you're allowed. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I asked yeah. permission. That's correct. Somebody's got to be watching him. I am hoping that Charlie will appear soon on the pod. Like, I, it, there might have been like a, I don't know, not a scream, but a cry. That yeah, heard. Uh, there, yeah. Was a, there was a light cry in the <laughs> last was, episode. A yeah. little yeah. bit of an Easter egg. Yeah. Did, so, I tell uh, you, did I tell you about the letter that I wrote to him in his baby book? God. So um, in the baby book, you, the, the parents kind of write an, uh, an early letter. Is that when you give his first fingerprints? Uh, you can't, I mean, he's not a criminal. <laughs> oh, I mean, <laughs> handprint or footprint or whatever? Yeah, you can put those in there, sure. Do you but, have uh, yours in there? Uh, do I have mine in there? Yeah. 
Why would I put my fingerprints in his baby book? <laughs> no, no, right? no, no, no. I mean, I mean, did you put Charlie's hand in the baby book and in his feet? Uh, that, no, that's we haven't mind. done that yet. Okay. We haven't done that yet. And uh, um, so Catherine and I each wrote a letter to him. And uh, I found at the end, I wanted to say, and by the way, um, you should lip it, listen to episode 55 of Out of Office, the travel podcast oh, that I was gosh. recording when you were born. It's so, the first yeah. time we, we announced your birth. And so just think of how many hours of, of wonderful content he's going to have to discover his father. <laughs> just think how, how, how who's going to pay the, uh, you know, the, the podcast hosting fee for the next <laughs> 27 keep years. Keep I mean, live I like so to hear it. But presumably we'll put it, we'll donate it to some library, you know, you, yeah, don't, think, yeah, well, you don't think the Harvard libraries would take this? I, oh, think, I think so. I think, I think Yale would steal it, but Harvard would, uh, <laughs> Harvard would take it. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, listen, if Charlie's still listening all the way here in, uh, episode 59, God bless him. Uh, you know, if I've passed away, I love you deeply. And, uh, if I'm still alive, you know what? Go give your old dad a call. This is, this turned dark very quickly. <laughs> very Maybe one quickly. episode we should do uh, like a, an after we die episode. That's, that's a really neat idea. <laughs> what, tra traveling across the, uh, uh, across, the ri river sticks. That's you exactly know? right. Yeah. Traveling across the river sticks. I love it. Uh, um, so, but uh, listen, uh, we're taking up too much time. I have one last time I need to call on listeners to, to do a little bit of homework, which is uh, we've got a great guest coming up. She's a New York Times uh, advice columnist in the travel section. Her name is Sarah Fershing, and she's got a new column called Tripped Up. And in the past couple episodes I've asked for these, we've got some great travel disaster stories coming in, but I need more because I just need to get the very best ones. Because, you know, this is a New York Times journalist. We got to right. be on our show, our, put our best foot forward. Absolutely. And so uh, let me just give you a sense of uh, how she describes the advice column. She says, I will help Times readers get restitution for their thorniest travel misadventures. Restitution? While, uh, restitution. I think that she uh, aspires to actually uh, right the wrongs that are oh done, gosh. not just... Well, I'm, t I'm sending her something right now. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, we, we've gotten some stories of folks that uh, were jailed when they entered a country. That was, You were close to that fate, Ryan. Um, <laughs> We, we had some that were just kind of luggage stories, but some that had uh, some, some interesting twists about what happened to the luggage, where it was. Um, so if you have a great travel disaster story, write it into outofofficepod at gmail.com. And do it right now, because I'm going to be recording that episode in a week, and, and, and I, we, we need it quick. Uh, so uh, the other place you could submit it to us, Ryan. Oh, my gosh. On the Instagram, at O podcast. O O O podcast. That's right. O O O podcast. But that's right. O podcast is if you pronounced it that way. Well, Keenan, I'm looking forward to just laying on the grass and looking up at that dark sky with all those beautiful stars and listening to your interview with Valerie Stimmick. That's right. Valerie Stimmick, author of Dar Authoress? Do you say Authoress? I don't think you do. No, I think <laughs> okay. you just say Authoress. Author of uh, Lonely Planets, Dark Skies, A Practical Guide to Astro Tourism. It's time to take off. Cabin crew? Flight attendants, prepare for takeoff, please. Today, my guest is uh, Valerie Stimmick, author of a new book from Lonely Planet called Dark Skies, A Practical Guide to Astrotourism. It's a beautiful tome filled with gorgeous photos, part coffee table book, part guidebook, all about why folks need to get out there and explore the universe. So, Valerie, thanks for coming on the show. And let's start right at the title. What is astrotourism? Yeah, astrotourism is a new area of travel. I wouldn't say it's new in terms of people doing it, but the title is rather new, that there's this uh, single word that can be used to describe the type of tourism that people are doing when they go out to go stargazing or they go to see an eclipse or they go watch a rocket launch. Mm -hmm. That has all suddenly been uh, umbrellaed under the term astrotourism. So from our perspective when writing this book, we were aiming to create a guide or resource for travelers who like space-related experiences on Earth and all the different ways that that might look for different travelers. And, uh, you know, you break out the book in kind of useful chunks where there's, you know, places where you, you recommend stargazing, then the kind of truly dark places on Earth that still exist. And then you jump into kind of the more specific uh, astro uh, astronomical happenings like the aurora eclipses 
Um, and then you, you even go to kind of the uh, observatories that one can get into. And then I love that you conclude we have a, a whole separate uh, episode on space tourism and the fact that soon you will be able to escape the light pollution of Earth and actually uh, get up and see the sky uh, uninterrupted by the atmosphere. Yeah, there's sort of a, I don't know that there's a debate, but I think that there is some contention between whether astrotourism is part of space tourism or space right, tourism is right. part of astrotourism. <laughs> yeah. uh, in this book, it's it's the second way. It's space tourism is lumped in with astrotourism, but I think it's, I actually think it's the opposite way around that eventually space tourism will be a much bigger field. And so astrotourism as an earth-based space tourism will be a segment of space tourism, but not the whole thing. And you you go out of your way to make the point that, you know, you don't need to go to one of these truly dark places to appreciate the night sky. But the book brought out a lot of information that I didn't know about light pollution. Um, the the forward had this stat that just caught me really off guard. Over 80 percent of the world's population lives under light polluted skies. And in the U.S., it's 99 percent. So how do you define light pollution and, and how does that affect the ability to see the night sky? Yeah, ab- absolutely. Great question. Light pollution is generally defined, and we defined it this way in the book, as any light which is not shining on the, the intended um, recipient of that light, in this sort of a vague way to say it, or which is escaping the direction from which it should be pointing. So for example, we're not saying turn off all lights. That's not the case. I don't think you'll see anyone (laughs) in the dark sky movement saying no lights ever. Like we don't want to go back to caveman dark ages. But the idea is that a lot of the lighting fixtures and a lot of the lighting solutions we currently have light way more than we need them to, right? So we don't need lights on all night if there are no people around doing Mm -hmm. things in that area. We also don't need light that spills out to the sides or up because generally humans aren't out to the sides or up from a light fixture. (laughs) Uh, So the idea is not to go completely dark, but what we're seeing in the light uh, pollution, dark sky movement is the idea that you implement solutions that make sure light is just where you want it to be and not polluting anywhere else in the area around the light fixture. And uh, there's even groups that that certify this. Um, so the International Dark Sky Association is sort of the leading group. Uh, give a sense of, you know, what what does that group do? How does it measure? And what does that certification, uh, how does how does a place earn that certification? Yeah, the, the main thing, and I, I haven't done this myself, so I'm not 100% an expert on the process, but I was just in Western Ireland at a convention that was all about protecting the night sky. And so there were a lot of people at that which had, been through this process. The International Dark Sky Association, one of their main initiatives is the Dark Sky Places project. So they work with local destinations to collect data on the quality of dark skies and then to work with them to implement lighting changes and certify that they meet certain criteria. And they have different levels of dark sky certification, uh, which basically certifies how big and how dark the area is. But the main thing is that they work with the local community or the local volunteers that are doing the measurements to gain a good insight into how dark the sky actually is and then to preserve that darkness. So it may mean changing all the lighting fixtures in a national park so that they are dark sky compliant and that ensures that they'll stay dark skies above the national park in the future. Yeah, and I saw um, two... two na- I, we nerd out about national parks on this pod a lot and... Uh, there are two that I've been to that I saw just this year got the certification, Arches National Park in Utah and uh, Bryce Canyon National Park. And uh, when I was at Bryce, actually, I had talked to a ranger uh, about why they were applying for this. And, you know, she was basically saying, like, once you get this certification as, a, as, an, as an international dark sky park, then you can really start getting more astro tour. You can get on the map of more astro tours and you can put, run, you know, public education. Um, you know, maybe instead of taking a ranger walk, you can come and give a, a ranger talk at night about that night sky. Yeah, it definitely opens doors for tourism. People are increasingly aware of the certifications offered and the uh, IDA, the International Dark Sky Association, they're sort of the biggest and I think mo- the most widely regarded. There are others. There's a European one. I believe it's called the Starlight Foundation. And they're doing the same exact work. So people are paying attention when those announcements come out. I regularly see, and Lonely Planet obviously is interested because they've produced a book on the subject, but their news channel is regularly sharing when there's new dark sky parks, 
You mm. can occasionally see Nat Geo Travel talking about it. That there's a lot more attention on the idea that we might want to travel specifically for a dark sky experience. And the travel media landscape is reacting and promoting that, which is great. And in your book, you know, you 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 basically uh, take in the entire globe. I mean, you talk about places in in China and Chile and Norway and uh, all across the U.S. and Hungary. I mean, you 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 didn't limit your search. And how many how many sites do you ultimately? You have about a hundred here, right? Yeah, I think I think so. It's been a while since I did the count. <laughs> but in the darkest places, you have sort of thirty five of those darkest yes. locations left on Earth. Which, when yeah. you hear that eighty percent of the world's population lives under light polluted skies, you know, you realize, oh gosh, are there many more beyond 35? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, there are. And that's what's interesting. So we've definitely gotten, I'll, I'll call it constructive feedback on the book that of all the places that we've missed. Yeah. Um, of course, we missed places. This was not meant to be an encyclopedia. I assure you, this would be an encyclopedia if we included every place, even just that was certified. There are over a hundred IDA certified dark sky places. That doesn't include any places certified by any other associations or foundations that are doing the same work. And so how did you choose what what destinations to include in the book, given that, as you say, it wasn't meant to be comprehensive. It was representative. And also, it's just, you know, as somebody who's just getting interested in, in these sorts of trips, it, this, it kind of, this book whets your appetite to get out there and learn more. That's exactly what we were aiming for. The main criteria that we used was um, experiential diversity, geographic diversity, and uh, in some ways, the ease of tourism access. Mm. So there are some fantastic dark sky locations that are really hard to get to. And we were aware that this wasn't meant to be uh, the primary guide for the diehard astrotourism mm -hmm. traveler. It was more intended to inspire people to start thinking about this as a form of travel to maybe augment an existing trip that they're already planning with mm. a dark sky experience. So in the U.S. especially, we wanted to be very conscious to try and map as much of the U.S. as possible. So you'll find um, one of the ones we got a lot of great feedback on was there's Cherry Springs State Park in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. That one is most people don't realize how good of dark skies. And it's a tiny, tiny pocket because most of the eastern seaboard is a mess of light pollution. But there's this right. tiny pocket in Pennsylvania or Headlands International Dark Sky Park in Michigan. Wow, that gives a lot of access to people across the Midwest if they were planning a weekend or a week trip to that region anyway. The Southwest U.S., obviously, there were too many choices and we had to yeah. narrow it down. <laughs> And then we also thought globally. So um, we advocated strongly for places in Eastern Europe, which is exceptionally light polluted, uh, places in the Middle East, places in Southeast Asia, things, the areas that you might not expect to see dark skies. We were also conscientious to encourage tourism into those regions to help inspire uh, light protection or dark sky protection and, and reducing light pollution across the globe. Yeah, for me, this is going to become one of those reference books that among the many the sort of guidebooks I keep on the shelves here, um, you know, it reminds me of kind of the thousand places to see before you die, where if I'm heading somewhere, I always pick it up and kind of flick through to see, is there anything else I should be adding on to the itinerary in order to, to, you know, broaden out places that don't make it into every guidebook about a place? Exactly. And this is a nice book in that regard, in that it samples from areas you might not expect. And certainly, inspires you to do an activity you would probably not have realized was an option. And so were you interested in astro tourism before before writing this book? Yeah, actually, I the the story I tell is that I, I was a space nerd as a kid. Mm -hmm. um, I had some very distinctive space memories growing up and I wanted to be an astronaut because I think that probably 30 percent of kids want to be an astronaut <laughs> course, at some yeah. point. Uh, to, totally took my career in a different direction and then um, as part of my travel writing career, I started a website called Space Tourism Guide, which was, it, it still is intending to serve the space tourism uh, sector of the mm -hmm. industry. But in the meantime, it's been focused almost exclusively on astrotourism. So we create stargazing city guides, aurora guides, uh, eclipse, uh, basically like eclipse guides, where it teaches you everything you need to know about the eclipse and where you can see it when there's one coming up. And so I was already writing on the topic when I pitched the book idea to Lonely Planet. And I believe that having a website and being able to say, look, I'm getting visitors. This is a big thing. People are interested. Here are the questions they're asking. Here are the activities that are getting good responses. That all helped shape the book and sell Lonely Planet on the idea that this really was a whole market segment they weren't serving already. 
And uh, you wrote a great blog, blog post on your on your sort of proper blog, which bears your name, Valerie and Valise, which I like because, you know, you're using an old time, what is a French word for suitcase or an old timey word yep, for suitcase. Yep. And uh, you wrote there about the pitching process and the writing process. And, and I feel that there must be a typo because you said you wrote this book in 10 weeks. Yes, I did. Uh, and 10 weeks was That's actually, <laughs> <laughs> it was actually less than 10 weeks in terms of my work, but I had 10 weeks between the date the contract was signed and the, and the flat plan was approved and the day I turned in the final piece of the draft. Wow. Um, basically what happened was I pitched the book in June mm -hmm. and it took a few weeks, um, a little over a, mo a month for Lonely Planet to do what they, their sort of internal research process, which is talking to their sales and marketing people, doing some internal feelings on is this a product that fits with our brand? Is it a product that we think we can sell? What markets is it going to work well in, et cetera? Do we have the resources to produce it? What's the timeline? And what they determined was because Lonely Planet was already going to be announcing that dark sky tourism was one of their trends of 2019. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they had another book that I worked on called The Universe coming in. I saw in. that. <laughs> yeah, yes. that book came out um, in October. So it was around the same time that Dark Skies came out. They said, we really want to get this done, but we need we need it by the end of October of 2018 to be able to produce it in the autumn of 2019. Mm. And so by the time I got the contract and everything was agreed upon, that was mid-August. And I had the end of August, all of September and all of October to turn it around. So it was about 10 weeks. And it's funny too, because I was on the road for about five or six of those weeks in the 10 weeks. So I was doing, you know, travel writer work and then coming back to my hotel and cranking out the the assignments that I had set myself. And the nice thing was the way the book is organized, it's really sort of chunks. Yes. And so I could say, okay, Valerie, today you just need to write three dark sky locations. Mm. And I know roughly how long that takes so I can allocate, you know, here's here's how long that's going to take, here's how many words that is. And when that's done, you can let it go. You don't have to do anything until tomorrow when you write the next three chunks. What exactly was your research process? Did you start with kind of web resources about these destinations, combine it with, you know, the lonely plan up write-ups that existed and then do some original reporting as well? Yep, exactly. It was a nice complement of the three different sources as well as my own knowledge. So because mm -hmm. I had been writing, there were definitely locations that were in the book that I had personally been to well before working on the book, or I had already researched extensively as part of another article. And so I could look back at my own writing and say, what did I say about this destination? What kinds of questions have I received from my readers? How can I make this even stronger when I put it in the book? So given that you cover a hundred different destinations here that, you know, all have kind of things to recommend them for astrotourism, if somebody's just starting to dabble or get interested here in stargazing and seeing a dark sky park, uh, what are a few places either in the U.S. or internationally that you would point them to, you know, put this on your short list? Yeah, that's a, another great question. Also very challenging because the book is filled with so many fantastic places and all the other places we couldn't even include. Right. <laughs> uh, okay, so let me see if I can narrow it down. First, I would say if you're enthusiastic about this, New Zealand is a dream astrotourism hmm. destination. There are several locations in the book in different sections that are all in New Zealand. So for example, um, there are several dark sky parks and reserves in New Zealand. You can see rocket launches in New Zealand and you can see the Southern lights in New Zealand. Hmm. So Z New Zealand is like, it's on, it's number one on my travel bucket list currently. I haven't been, but absolutely. And they're working so hard to reduce light pollution. They're actually talking about trying to get certified as a dark sky nation. Oh my God. <laughs> which isn't a class of certification yeah, that even exists. Thing. That's not <laughs> right. a thing. And when you think about that, like you, that means every person in the entire country is on board with this enough to change their lighting fixtures on the outside of their home wow. to make sure that they're reducing light pollution. It's going to be incredible if they That's can accomplish amazing. that. And I really hope. Um, the other, let's see, other ones that jump out. Chile is a fantastic destination. I spent time in the Elki Valley, which is sort of Northern Chile. It's a dark sky certified location fantastic stargazing. There's a lot of touristic observatories there, which makes it really accessible. Mm -hmm. uh, Jordan, the Middle Eastern country of Jordan, is wonderful. We have Wadi Rum in the book, which I've been to, and I'm actually leading a tour there in March oh, wow. that just sold out. Um, if people are curious, we're probably going to offer it again, and the details will be <laughs> on the website at some point. Which website? And, uh, Space Tourism Guide. Okay. And then uh, within the U.S., I would say if you're planning a trip of any kind and you want to augment it with dark sky tourism, the southwestern U.S., so all of the national parks in that area are either certified, working to be certified, or are just fantastic dark sky locations that aren't certified yet and maybe aren't working on it, but you can still see the night sky really well. 
Um, and then you can even stretch into Southern California a little bit, Death Valley, Joshua hmm. Tree. Those are also great. Now you can do a national parks road trip and see the night sky every night in glorious wonder. The main point I would make in, if you're choosing to travel for any dark sky experience, especially stargazing is keep an eye on the moon phases. Mm -hmm. So right now, as we're recording this, it was a full moon last night. And I don't know if you went outside and could see the moon, but when the moon is full, it blows out a Mm. vast portion of the night sky. Um, I don't, I'm sure someone has measured the exact scope of the pollution generated by the moon when it's totally full, but it's probably somewhere I would guess in the range of about 25 to 30% of the sky. And so if you're trying to stargaze on a full moon, you're not going to see anywhere near the wonder you're going to see on a new moon when it's completely dark. That damn, that damn moon. What has it ever given us? Come on, moon. Everything. That's the problem. (laughs) Literally, I can't be mad at the moon. She's wonderful. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And do you think that there are any um, misconceptions about astrotourism? Like, I know one that always strikes me is that obviously on Instagram, like, you know, you can follow all these amazing accounts that show beautiful pictures of night skies. And often, uh, you know, personally, I went to Iceland last year. And so I was really pumped up about seeing the Aurora Borealis. And uh, um, I did manage to see it. But one thing you appreciate when you see it is just how different it looks in person in real life than how it looks in a lot of photographs. And the book dives into that a bit of like how, how to shoot a dark sky photography. And so, you know, do you think there's anything that, what, what, what's some expectation setting that you would have for folks, uh, as far as going out and either trying to photograph or just see amazing things in the sky? Yeah, that's a great question. The main thing that we worked hard in this book, and I actually pushed pretty hard back to Lonely Planet on is that I wanted the photos to be beautiful and inspiring, but as reasonably accurate. Hmm. So the main concern that I had is that a night sky photography, two things happen. One, the camera is far better at capturing light than our eyeballs are. Yes, yes. And it can stack that light if you want to think of the way that a long exposure, it's kind of layering on light over and over onto the, the medium, which in this case, it's all digital now, but back in the days it was film. Sure. And so photos of the night sky are often far more detailed. They have better color. You can see a lot more than you'll ever see with your own eyes. So it's easy to go out and see the Milky Way. And like, that's not what it looks like. There's no color. It doesn't have the same shape. But (laughs) that's actually a good thing um, because you're seeing it accurately the way humans have seen it for millennia. And if you're seeing the Milky Way, you're among a very small group of people in the world that can see the Milky Way. So you should appreciate that. The other thing I would... Uh, encourage people to be conscientious of is composite photography. So Mm. composite astrophotography has become pretty popular where photographers will shoot the night sky, shoot the foreground during the day with a filter and then composite those photos together. Mm -hmm. There was an article actually, it was published by Lonely Planet and I, I wrote them and I said, can we please not do this in the book because it was clearly a composite and it just didn't look real to me. Mm. And I said, we, we know that the vast majority of people who pick up this book won't know that it's a composite. They're not, you know, they, they haven't looked at the photos enough to be able to see that. But what I would hate is for us to encourage someone to go to that location thinking that's what they're going to see. Right. Because they're not. And that's we're, not fair as a, you know, we're travel guide company. We're ri- I'm writing for a travel guide company. I want people to have a, an accurate experience within the scope of what's possible. Sure. Right. The other, the other thing people should be aware of is clouds. <laughs> those, can, yeah. those can really scuttle an astrotourism trip. Yeah, the weather, it's funny, my website traffic, because that's what I have real insight on about, you know, astrotourism data. Uh, weather plays a huge role. Um, seasonality, of course, because humidity, cloud cover, um, anything like that changes on a seasonal basis for most destinations. And then um, there's the astronomical events, which we haven't really talked about very much, but those are like hugely impactful on people's interest in seeing Mm -hmm. an astrotourism experience. So if there's a meteor shower like the Perseids or the Geminids, which are coming up in just a couple weeks, about a month from now, uh, that gets a huge spike in interest. So it's almost like people are planning their trips when they're researching based on an event, just like they would for, you know, Oktoberfest or St. Patrick's Day, something like that. Right. Burning Man. Yeah. Burning Man. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And uh, the Geminids, as you mentioned, are December 4th to the 17th. And uh, where would be a place that folks could go see those? Well, it depends on where you're listening from. Mm -hmm. Um, But I'm going to assume that most people listening are probably in an urban or suburban area. 
And I would recommend um, you're going to try and get at least an hour outside of town, if not two hours, and make a, make a night of it. Mm-hmm. Um, Google does a pretty good job of producing results for the query stargazing near me. So if you just go into Google and you search stargazing near me, you'll often find my website. If you live in certain urban areas, you'll find Reddit. A lot of Redditors are very avid astronomy nerds. And so there might be a good list in Reddit, which is publicly accessible. Uh, You might see resources from space.com, which is a longstanding space media company. And that will help you get started trying to plan something. If you do want to try and go, what I recommend doing is doing that research on where you might go now. Keep an eye on the forecast. Maybe don't make your reservations till the week of, but be aware that things may book out because if it's going to be clear skies on a major meteor shower, there will be people going. Yeah, I had that experience. I was trying to head to Yellowstone and the Grand Tetons for the last uh, full solar eclipse, and I had everything booked. And uh, then my brother called me and he said, I just heard on NPR that there are no rental cars out there. I said, "What, what what are you talking about? He's like, they all got rented out like three months ago. Because yeah. people were more on top of their trip planning than you. And I actually had to cancel the trip because I, I could not physically move around that part of the country, which is not easy to move around without a car. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's, uh, I would say on the scale of planning ahead for the astronomy experience, regardless of the weather, eclipses are the big, big yeah. one. There's, yeah, yeah. And that was really where I realized that we had a huge opportunity to improve the tourism offering and and the resources available was the 2017 eclipse Mm. because it vastly exceeded the number of people they were. I mean, it was, it was a mess. You should almost be glad you didn't make it. Um, and uh, am I safe to assume if you're also, uh, so passionate about seeing the night sky, you're also a sci-fi nerd. A little bit. Yeah. (laughs) Are are you a a star Trek? Are you a star Wars? All of the above. (laughs) Oh, wow. That that, That is a surprising take. I would say, I, as a kid, I was a Star Wars fan. Um, uh-huh. There's something uh, unbelievable about the epic hero's journey, and I actually woke up this morning and remembered that. And watched that, The Mandalorian? Uh, no. Oh. No. But I remembered <laughs> that the, the last Star Wars is coming out in like a month, and I don't even know any of the details, so I That's probably right. need to put it on my calendar. Yeah, but right, right. I also, I mean, it's funny, right now we're watching The Next Generation. And so uh, wow. what I find most interesting in sci-fi is how much it has informed the development of human technology. Uh, huh. I think sci-fi writers have a, and I admire them because people who can imagine universes in their head and create new technologies in their mind, uh, they have a quite heavy responsibility because what they think of, we will make. If it's cool enough and helpful enough in TV or in a book, it's pretty likely that we'll hmm. eventually create it as we figure out the technology. And you can see that has occurred for decades now where as soon as the technology was capable of being created in line with, you know, the tricorder or the transporter from Star Trek, we're working on those things now because they, they seemed really cool and we think we might need them in the future. Yeah. I mean, you know, the the largest uh, science fiction collection uh, at a university is at MIT. <laughs> yeah. So that there probably is a close link there and they would stand by that. Yep. This is a field of tourism that is kind of being underestimated right now. I've been yeah. getting that pushback a lot um, mm-hmm. from when I first started, especially space tourism. There's a lot of concerns, and I think some of them are quite valid about the impact of space tourism, the necessity of space tourism. Uh, but what I would say is that if you have an interest in this, I recommend trying to plan an experience where you can see the Milky Way. Because in addition to the, there's, an, there's a phenomena in outer space travel called the overview effect where individuals who can see the curvature of the Earth and the vastness of space beyond gain an awareness of our place in the solar system and the universe. And there's some fantastic semi-philosophical books about this. I think the Milky Way does the same thing. And the Milky Way, though most of us can't see it on any given night, is accessible for many travelers, especially travelers who might end up with a copy of Dark Skies in their hands, you know, I, I understand that there are parts of the world where light pollution and development are so bad that it would be quite challenging for someone to plan a weekend trip and see the Milky Way. But if you do have access to a dark sky location, even one that's not certified, getting out there and seeing the Milky Way, if you've, especially if you've never seen it before, it's been a while, it gives me goosebumps every time. And I've seen it far more than my kind of fair share in the human population. So I would encourage people to make that a priority because I think it, it, it gives us a sense of our scale and scope, and it makes our problems both smaller and larger 
it really emphasizes that our planet is very special and we need to take care of it, but also that our single individual problems are not as big as we make them out to be. And all of that is just good. It's a good way to approach life. Take care of the planet. Don't blow things out of proportion. And the Milky Way seems to be able to do that for people. Well, that's a that's a great final pitch to to end on. So uh, the book is uh, from Valerie Stimmick, Dark Skies, A Practical Guide to Astrotourism. A great holiday gift, I would say. And uh, thank you so much for, for coming on. And now it's time for the last stop. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the last stop on this train. Everyone, please leave the train. Well, you know what? Karen, and that was a great interview, but I'm a little disappointed that she doesn't give any uh, shout out to beaches on the East Coast because I've had such lovely nights. There's too much light pollution there. She she's talking about really seeing the stars. I, not there's no there's no east there's no stars in the East Coast. That is completely not true. If you are in like the, in the Delaware uh, the Delaware uh, coastline or even some parts of Maryland uh, where I grew up uh, in Dames Quarter, uh, there was no, <laughs> one houses for miles. Uh, you could there, you could really see the stars and lay on the beach and I, I you know I just it look I want to go to Rocket Alabama as well <laughs> Rocket like, City Alabama yeah, yeah that All sounds right, like a, yeah. that sounds like a cool town but uh-huh. you know just a little beach stargazing you know I, All right well be, beach stargazing is not a bad follow up uh, maybe we could pitch it to Valerie Stimmick but it, it, it could regardless. be called like moderately dark skies or just yeah like, moderately <laughs> dark skies a guide to sort of astro tourism. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you very much uh, to Valerie Stimmick. It was wonderful uh, to talk to you, and uh, you should pick up that Lonely Planet book. Very unique. But enough dillying and dallying, Ryan. We are here in the last stop. That's the, the last segment of the show. That's why it's called The Last Stop. It's your favorite segment. It's my favorite segment, popularly known as the People segment. It's uh, where you and I each take a moment to talk about one thing that we, we've experienced that week. Maybe we read it. Maybe we tasted it. Maybe we bought it. Might it be, be something we done? Might have been something we created? Could be a song we heard? Maybe a song we sang? It could be anything. As long, this is the, the rule, as long as that thing fed the spirit of wanderlust within us, even during the workaday week. Because even though you, you're going to be traveling for the next few months, uh, not everyone can do that. And you need to, to, to feed that wanderlust. So I got to ask you, as, as you're prepping, as surely as you're packing your suitcase, following all those tips that we said in the last pod, Ryan, do you right now have a last stop? I do. I, I did my yearly trip uh, to visit my my dear friend, uh, Aaron. Oh, hold on. That's uh, f- somewhere in Florida, right? Yeah, yeah. We go, we go every year to Tampa. I remember of- last year you went to Lettuce Lake. Lettuce Lake Park. Hey, look, I, Lettuce Lake Park is awesome. I'm yeah. not gonna. I'm I remember. Not gonna deny- I was surprised. Yeah, yeah I, I still recommend it. But this time he was like, "Look, let's let's get out of the mean streets of uh, <laughs> Tampa. Uh, Tampa, and uh, let's take a little drive an hour to St. Petersburg, um, mm. St. Petersburg, Florida, and we'll go to the Salvador Dali Museum now." Oh, if, if, in if, Florida? Yeah, if you're like me, you think a Salvador Dali Museum doesn't that belong in Amsterdam or you know? Yeah, right. uh, uh, you know, wouldn't that be somewhere in Spain? Spain yeah. Right. Um, but uh, no, uh, there is, while well, there is one in Europe, for whatever reason, and it's actually a funny reason, uh, uh, St. Petersburg has the largest Dolly collection outside of Europe. Wow. And it all, it's all because of this family from Ohio. They lived in Cleveland, uh, Reynolds and uh, Eleanor Morse. And they just started buying a lot of dollies in the 70s. I mean, you know, what a life, right? They're, and they realize at some point that they have over 200 uh, dollies and that these places, they, they need a home. So they put it up in their uh, hmm. office building in Cleveland. And so I just imagine some little like, <laughs> you're driving down the streets of Cleveland and there's, and there's like a shopping mall and it's like Dolly Land or something. And then you walk in, it's like 200 dollies. <laughs> right, uh, right. But, but then they realized they needed like a real home for, for these 200 works of art. And uh, St. Petersburg won out because they had this old industrial facility. So they moved their whole collection down there. Wow. But uh, it was completely rebuilt, rebuilt into this like massive, gorgeous museum in 2011. And I have to tell you, it's pretty remarkable uh, as, as a place to see a lot of Dolly. They've got plenty of stuff that I, I haven't seen. A lot of the more, more popular, you know, the era where he's doing the melting clocks and everything. But sure. uh, just a tremendous amount of his work. I have to think in Florida, that probably doesn't stand out that much because it gets so freaking hot that everything melts, right? So like a melting clock, everybody's <laughs> like, ah, it's a Tuesday. Well, it, it, when you look at the building, uh, the, the the architect when he designed it in 2011 definitely had, he wasn't trying to like copy 
Dolly, mm. but you can't have like a do- the Dolly Museum in, in like no. a <laughs> yeah. in like a old school like brutalist or something. It would be right. very strange. So yeah. he did it kind of where the the windows look like they're sort of melting and they're bulging out. It's it's huh. pretty, that it's sounds pretty kind intense. of like Gaudi. It is not that you know. It's not Gaudi. It's not uh, it's no Gaudi. <laughs> it's no Gaudi. Sure. Uh, but but it, it it yeah. You could see obviously another another Spaniard, right? You can see the the inspiration for for sure. Interesting. And do, do you generally like Dali? I I mean, Dali's one of those like one of those artists that you know a lot when you're in high school. Mm-hmm. So it's like the way that I read a lot of Vonnegut. You know, sure. I, I think of them as like intertwined in some way, but. Uh, <laughs> You know, I enjoy Dolly. There's, there's some good stuff in there. For me, there's a little too much of weird for the sake of weird. You know, it, right. it just doesn't. It doesn't really do it for me. But do, I, there, some of his early stuff is 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 way more. You know, before he got all kind of surreal, kinda surreal. So, he, so there are some of the kind of earlier. Real, a lot, yeah, yeah. There's a lot and of are the those early like stuff. photorealistic paintings. Yeah, they're they're they they they're they're definitely more like photorealistic. Although they ha- they tend to they look a little. Like there's a little Surat. He plays around with some different forms. Hmm. It's it's sort of interesting. I mean, he obviously had like he mastered painting, and before he before he was like, okay, I'm going to do this Dolly thing now. And um, when you went in, um, did you say to your what's your friend's name that you visit? Aaron. Did you say, hey, Aaron? Hello, Dolly. No, I didn't well, think about it until I until I said. Dolly. You know, it's so funny because I I just said uh, the Dolly Museum, and it's and I'm I have Dolly partner on the ring because I'm I'm planning a trip to Dollywood. <laughs> Um, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Why is not? that going to be an episode? Oh, my I, God. I, this I, I, this I, year is just going to be gangbusters. We got we to get Dolly on, right? <laughs> um, if we can get Dolly on. Yeah, let's. Uh, let's uh, I'm yeah. still working on Rick Steves, all right? Forget about Rick Steves. No, Dolly's no, a big no, deal. No. How okay? dare you? <laughs> all right, all right. Um, but yeah, this is, anyway, super cool museum. And uh, when you buy 200 paintings of someone when they're alive, they get to know you. So he became friends with this mm. couple and actually came to the opening of the Dolly Museum in St. Petersburg, Florida. So if you ever want to chuckle, just imagine Salvador Dali in St. Petersburg, Florida, just hanging wow. out. You know, it's very strange. I don't know. I mean, of all the states that seem kind of Dali-ish, <laughs> uh, I would say Florida's the weirdest one. I mean, sure. No, I feel like he'd be in some place like Sedona, Arizona or something like, you know, <laughs> some kind of hippie, more hippie place. St. Petersburg yeah, doesn't. all right. Fair point. Yeah. And, uh, one of the things that's like right outside of the of the Dolly Museum is it was built on one of the original Fountain of Youth in uh, in Florida. It was like a craze that happened in the early 1900s. In 1908, <laughs> a guy named Dr. Jesse Conrad bought the pier that uh, the Dolly Museum is on, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, apparently started selling uh, water that was uh, of the original Fountain of Youth that was physician endorsed. <laughs> I'm guessing doctor was just his first name. <laughs> <laughs> well, back then, it, I don't think it was that hard to become a doctor. But uh, <laughs> it was, it was St. Peter, apparently St. Petersburg used to be called Health City because of things like this. So, oh, Health City, of course. We yeah. all know St. Petersburg, <laughs> Health City. Absolutely. I almost said Health City when you said you were going to the Dali Museum. Yeah, so I did drink from that. And I'll let you know if uh, I, I, you know, my stomach was a little upset for a few days. But uh, maybe that's part of the, maybe that's how the youth kicks in. Well, you, yeah. you, you're looking great. Thank you. And uh, do you have a last stop this week, Kieran? I do have a last stop. This one's a little weird. Um, this was, you know, I'm, I wouldn't say that I'm a person that's like obsessed with the, the history of the airline industry. It's actually something I feel like I should know more about. I'm trying to learn more about. And I'm, I'm preparing for a, an interview that we've got coming up uh, probably next month. And uh, I'm learning about uh, the Pan Am. Do you, do you know much about Pan Am? Like from Mad Men. From Mad Men, from and Catch like, Me If musical You Can. Theater. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Yeah. exactly. Like, Pan Am was basically the uh, the plane brand that uh, brought kind of overseas travel uh, into the modern age and made it uh, sexy, made it uh, this uh, kind of uh, dream. And this this age of the jet set really can't, right. that is synonymous with Pan American World Airways. And uh, it, it was founded in 1927, and it closed in 1991. So by airline standards, it had a really long run. And um, through all those eras, you know, there's, of course, just uh, thou- tens of thousands of pieces of paper that cut- come out of a great company like that. There's internal publications. There's photos of all the great old planes. There's, like, an employee newspaper. There's a beautiful graphic materials because Pan Am— uh, used to invest in 
creating, um, they, they would hire artists to create these beautiful uh, travel posters that sort of inspired, right. you know, imagine in the in the 50s dreaming of what Hawaii was like. Th you know, this you, is a similar aesthetic to your national park aesthetic. It's a very similar aesthetic. Yeah. That's totally right. It's a very similar aesthetic. And in fact, I have seen a, a friend who has an original Pan Am poster that was like a New England poster and it's like a lovely fall painting. Um, I, they're quite fine works of art. And so I was kind of Googling around trying to figure out, um, you know, what I could explore and find on these. And as it turns out, Pan Am gave its, its full archive to the University of Miami library system. And they have spent uh, clearly a huge amount of effort digitizing just tons and tons, 1,500 boxes of administrative, legal, financial, technical, and promotional materials. And uh, so much of it is available for free online. It, it is so cool to look at these vintage airlines. You get to see the the, the flight attendants from the, the 30s on. And you can explore all of this great art that this once great airline had. And um, it really inspired me for the, the interview that's going to be coming up when I talk to. There is a Pan Am Heritage Association that's all uh, like collectors of and enthusiasts of that classic jet age. Are we going to learn like what happened to Pan Am when you do that interview? Yeah, absolutely. Of course. Oh, I, can't, I can't wait. Of course. The interview is actually going to be with the founder's son. That's amazing. Anyway, I will post uh, a link to this library's collection um, uh, if for the, from the University of Miami. It's called Cleared to Land, the Records of Pan American World Airways uh, Incorporated. And it is one of the, just these quirky little corners of the internet that, you know, you, you don't think you would stumble on and find it, but you could spend hours going through this digitized material. And trust me, I'm speaking as somebody uh, who has. <laughs> I am truly excited to hear more about this, uh, the history of Pan Am. That's, that is a lot of fun. Yeah, it's going to be great. And I think it's really going to make us appreciate just how shitty airline travel is today. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? Well, what are we talking about next week? <laughs> <laughs> as, a, as a Freudian slip, because you know who's, uh, who's carrying the water here. Next week is finally the interview with Sarah Fershin, the travel columnist from the New York Times, uh, who, whose advice column Tripped Up is all about your travel disasters. So get them in to outofofficepod at gmail.com, and she will answer some of your queries. Well, until next week, travel safely. I'm Ryan Davis. And I'm Karen Schmidt. And this is Out of Office, a travel podcast. The seat taken. I mean, now that I know she might get some money back, I'm sending her, I got a whole bunch of uh, com travel complaints. I mean, I think she might mean emotional restitution. I don't know what that even is. I don't think a, a, a newspaper is paying out actual no, restitution. No, I'm just imagining like those old, those like uh, local TV spots where they, uh, uh, you know, like, like number five on your side oh. and they like... <laughs> 